Now, <clears throat> the teacher has already demonstrated that they have kept themselves away from the world in their prayers, that they have had their periods of inner communion, maybe for weeks, months, years, or decades, because we're all different. And they have attained this power of grace, this power of inner communion. And people who are opposed to their spiritual studies now are no longer opposed. Uh, people who didn't personally like them begin to like them or understand them. In other words, this inner communion begins to appear visibly tangible in uh, fulfillment. And yet, they never forsake the principle of secrecy. What takes place within them is their secret. And uh, they have no do-gooder complex. They lose all desire to save the world because they know the world cannot be saved. You cannot go out and give this to the human world. Therefore, it knows that my own shall come to me. Those of my own household will come to me. And the bread, the manna that I have received from heaven, I will gladly share. But I won't share it with the world, I'll tell you that. I won't go out and tell it to my lawyer and my tax man and my baker and my plumber. No. And as I travel the world, I will not tell it to the hotel people where I stop. Even though they've known me for years and years and years, they still don't know what I do. Because, except in the rare cases where someone comes... Now, in teaching, the teacher will give this as a principle to the dedicated students, the real seeking students, and will say, now it is with you to develop the minutes and finally the hours of inner contemplation until you arrive at that period of in a response, telling no man what you're doing, not letting it be seen, not even your family. Wait till you're in your bedroom or wait till you're in your bathroom. Wait till you're somewhere or go to a public library. Go somewhere where you can be in a corner, and do your praying in secrecy, and uh, as fulfillment comes in the outer plane, don't explain it, don't tell it, keep the fingers on the lips, secrecy is the greatest power in the world, and the only time that it is permitted, it is in imparting it, because when I impart it to you, I am imparting it to myself, if I were to impart this to the human mind, I'd be hitting up against a brick wall that would bounce back at me like a ball would bounce back. But in imparting it to you, it doesn't bounce back. You brought yourself here. You were seeking not loaves and fishes, but bread, meat, wine, and water, and not of a physical nature. Then you have benevolence. Be sure that you do your benevolences not to be seen of men. Now this doesn't mean that uh, you have to send anonymous cash to wherever you want. It doesn't quite mean that. You can send your check here, there, or the other place. But in doing it, <clears throat> ask that it uh, not be publicized on any lists or that it be credited to a friend. In other words, 
uh, make certain that uh, you have no desire at all that this world know about it, that your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Do you think? Then it's perfectly all right for the community fund to know that you're a generous giver or the Boy Scouts. Or the, that's all right what they know because they too are part of that that is uh, working for the same purpose that you are contributing. They're contributing in a different way. As long as they don't, and you don't make it a matter of the newspapers and the public acclaim. Praise that comes to you unsolicited is of a different thing. What the master was warning against was the making of a public display. Now again, the principle is the same. What I give in benevolence, I am not giving to somebody out here. I am giving to the Christ of my own being. It's something that takes place within me. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And the Christ knows all. And above all, it would know hypocrisy. Therefore, the Master says, in praying publicly and in doing benevolences publicly, you gain the praise of men, but you lose God. In other words, you lose this that has taken place within you. Therefore, the teacher will teach students not only the value but the power of secrecy. And eventually we'll be able to show them that everything that takes place within you secretly within becomes known without. Whereas if you advertise it, it never becomes known because it isn't even believed. In other words, if I walked up and down the whole world saying how happy I am, I don't think many people would believe it. See that? Because they're not inclined to believe words that come out of the mouth. But I think that they feel something in your attitude that says, is a contented person, a happy person, a successful person, and so forth. Not that we need their praise, no. Once you have made contact with the spirit within, you really need nothing of man whose breath is in his nostril. Least of all is praise. Now, just think of this. Not only it is not known in the religious world, very few people know in the metaphysical world or spiritual world that secrecy is the greatest power on earth and that the inner communion with the Father in secret is the secret of outer harmony. And yet that is now what we in this infinite way must impart. We must reveal and not as if uh, giving you a class this morning, but if you are my student here and I were teaching continuously, it would be my function to nag you, to keep at you, until you began enough periods of inner communion and secrecy, until I could see by your outer life that you had in some measure attained. So, 
with each of these other principles it would be my function as a teacher to keep a close eye on you if necessary ask questions requiring truthful answers always remembering that if a teacher lies to a student they've lost their power if a student lies to a teacher they've lost their connection this cannot be someday you will discover that there will be happy marriages on earth I mean that these will be the rule rather than the exception but I will also tell you when these will come when a man and a wife have no secrets from each other when they do not feel that they do something that they don't want their mate to know when there is that complete openness of conduct and thought and there's no ground anymore because it establishes a relationship without words and without thoughts it establishes a confidence it establishes a something do you see that because you'd be surprised that in the intimacy that exists between two people in one household that a lie or in the consciousness of one becomes a discord in uh, the relationship in the other a distrust a mistrust a, a something no one may know why in the household but that's the reason that it is an impossibility for two people two partners in a business to be other than completely open and frank otherwise some discord enters and the reason is that whatever is taking place secretly is known openly and my secret relationship with my family is known to them openly even if they don't know what I'm lying about they know something is wrong See that? therefore there must come a complete relationship which is based on oneness since I am thou and thou art me how can there be anything of a secret nature so. then <clears throat> as the teacher works with these students with these principles one by one not feeling that they can impart this to anyone in a week or two or three or four it, they can't because they can only take about one of these principles at a time and a student can hardly believe that they'll demonstrate them in a week or two but they can take a principle for a week or two and then another principle for a week or two and then have the both principles for a week or two and so on and so forth remembering always that everything comes to fruition in silence in secrecy see that if you should ever wonder why in 17 years we have less than a dozen teachers in the entire world this will be the answer that <clears throat> the message of the infinite way cannot be taught with the mind a teacher must have come to some measure of demonstrated spiritual consciousness and the only way that anyone would know that they have is by the fruitage in other words if they were around me much I could tell it 
because I can feel their consciousness. But otherwise, I can only tell it by what is happening in their experience. And if they are finding themselves with larger and larger and larger practices, healing practices, I know right well that in their consciousness they are no longer sitting in judgment as to what's good and evil and what's good power and what's bad power. They've lost their fear of the world of effect. So I know they've attained because they could not be having the fruitage unless they had attained. And then as they are asked questions and I come in contact with their students who are well taught and that's further evidence to that. It is for this reason that from the beginning of the message of the infinite way it was made clear to me that it must never be organized. Because once you organize then you must have uh, an activity in Los Angeles and Chicago and New York and Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and San Francisco and so forth and so forth. But being unorganized, we don't have to have an, or, uh, a, an activity any place. I don't care if there's no activity any place on earth. Because I'm not organized. I'm not dependent on anybody's dues or contributions. Therefore, I don't care if there aren't any. My demonstration is that I and my father are one. And therefore, I must rely always on spiritual unfoldment for my income, my grace. Therefore, I could not allow myself to become dependent on establishing this, that, or the other thing. Well, the same place, the same way. The moment we would have a teacher that had not demonstrated their inner contact with the Father, we would have teachers looking for pupils and looking for classes and looking for fees. Then we would have no spiritual impartation. See that? Now, if the message of the infinite way is to function down through the ages, it will a in, in, it will in uh, it will function only through the consciousness of those who have attained this inner communion with the Father, the fruitage of which is divine grace. Then it makes no difference how few there may be. Those few will take care of the world because no more of the world will be led to them than they can take care of. Now, the time has come for our teachers to present these specific principles, give the student the opportunity of working inwardly with these specific principles until they attain some measure of oneness with them. Then they will say, like the Master, I have overcome the world. Well, he hadn't overcome Caesar, he hadn't overcome the Sanhedrin, but he overcame both Caesar and uh, the Sanhedrin so far as his life was concerned. They could crucify them, cry, fire him, but they couldn't keep him in a tomb. They could shut his mouth, but they couldn't stop his word. And so, each one of us in a measure comes to where we have overcome the world, meaning 
The world cometh to me as temptation, but findeth nothing in me. I can walk up and down a great big alley of uh, whiskey bottles and not feel the slightest temptation. I can walk right up and down a whole alley of uh, gambling tables and not feel the slightest <clears throat> temptation. Do you see what I mean? But what I really mean is that we can walk up and down a whole alley of sin and disease and lack and limitation and the threat of war and fear no evil. Because the temptation will be in the same nature as those whiskey bottles or those gaming tables. There just be pictures out there that findeth nothing in me to respond to. And so eventually, sin, disease, death, lack, limitation, are pictures out there that find nothing in me to respond to. In that measure, then, those who seek the grace of God will, in coming to me, be released from this world, from the human mind and its fears, and its temptations, and its two powers. So that we can rightly say that wherever Jesus walked, uh, sin evaporated, disease evaporated, lack evaporated. So we can say that wherever the spiritually illumined walk, Sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation evaporate. Probably not so far as the masses are concerned, because they didn't evaporate in the experience of the Master. He did not many mighty works, either in his hometown or in Jerusalem. But they evaporate wherever there is anyone trying to break through the throng. They evaporate wherever there is anyone sitting at the feet. And so teaching takes on another phase or facet in the message of the infinite way. You who are teachers and practitioners must see that you are this only by the grace of God. Be assured that your will, your wish, your desire will never make you a teacher or a practitioner. No amount of human longing will ever make you a teacher or a practitioner. The human longing may be an advance uh, inside information that that grace is going to come. But sometimes it is merely the ego that wants to be out front somewhere in a spotlight. So even when we have that desire, if we have it, we have to be very careful that it isn't the ego projecting itself. To me it is strange when I witness it because I myself never have had any desire to be a teacher or a practitioner. It never entered my mind to want to be one and uh, it was only under difficulty that I was drawn into it. And as I see with most of our teachers, it's happened that way with them. They wanted to avoid it. They didn't want to be brought out of their inner contemplation, but eventually they were compelled to. Now, if you can see that nothing on my part could ever have brought the message of the infinite way through me except the grace of God, then you can take the next step and say, 
Well, then Joel doesn't have to worry about how it is to be uh, given to the world, because whatever it is that is uh, pushing it through him is pushing it into consciousness and providing for it and carrying it around the world. Therefore, there's no personal responsibility on his shoulders except to watch his integrity every minute. Otherwise, uh, the rest, the spirit that produced the message will carry into human consciousness, providing fulfillment at every level of its need. Ah, the moment you see that, you are set free. Because the grace of God that made you a teacher or practitioner is the power of fulfillment. So that you do not have to seek students or patients. The grace of God brings them to your doorstep in proportion to your readiness for them. You do not have to be concerned whether or not uh, you can afford this place or that place because the grace of God that is functioning through you is paying for it. You are the transfer agent for the rent or the food or the clothing or the housing. But the grace of God is the producer. Now, this can be applied in your practice to every circumstance that is brought to you. And for instance, I have here a letter from a committee of people who are seeking to build a hospital in a small town where there isn't an adequate one. And uh, their problem is uh, a million and a half of dollars, which you can understand to the human mind is presenting a problem. And my answer is just this. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me, the Christ. Therefore, whatever it is that you believe you are going to do for sick people, or poor people, or crippled people, you are doing unto the Christ. Therefore, this activity in which you are engaged must be an activity of the Christ, because its object is to serve the least of these, my brethren. And in that passage, the Master referred to the fact that when I was sick, he comforted me, and when I was in prison, he visited me, and when I was poor, he fed me and clothed me. So therefore, this very activity that you are planning comes under that passage as a Christ activity. Therefore, the responsibility of paying for this hospital is not yours. You are the messengers, the transparencies, serving the Christ. You are the servants, serving the Christ. Because on the human level of life today, hospitals are necessary. Mental institutes are necessary. Homes for the aged are necessary. Nursing homes are necessary. And uh, since they are, and since they are a service to the poor and the sick and the needy, they are a service unto the Christ. There probably will come a day when human consciousness is completely evangelized and there will be no sickness to heal and no poverty to patch up. And then Christ activity will be of an entirely different nature. But just as we are doing spiritual healing, which is a recognition of the fact that there are those under the belief of sin and sickness and lack, 
and we are serving it through our spiritual means, they are doing it, the same thing, to the same people through the highest means at their command. And that desire to give a modern hospital, a complete hospital, a perfect hospital, is as Christly as our desire to bring forth harmony through our means. Well, in the same way with a business problem. Every activity of a normal business is a service. It's serving the least of these my brethren in one capacity or another. And therefore, every business that is conducted with the idea of integrity, service, honesty, is likewise a serving of the least of these my brethren, therefore it is a Christ activity. So that any problem that is brought to us, whether it's an unhappy household, or an unhappy business, or a failing business, or the desire to bring forth hospitals or institutions of one kind or another, all of these must be understood in the light of a service unto the least of these my brethren, therefore a service unto the Christ, and letting the Christ perform its functions through us. Then, as we learn to pray in secret, the way will be revealed to us in which monies may be raised, if it's necessary to raise them. Well, do you remember the story of the prodigal son who left his father's house and he used up all his substance and he finally ends up eating with the swine, realizes that even his father's servants are better off than he is, and then starts to return to the father's house. Well, now I'll tell you something. That never took place to an individual. That was not the experience of a man. The mystic who gave us this story was telling us the human mind left the father's house and has used up its substance and is turning back to the father's house. The human mind is the prodigal. The human mind is cut off from God. The human mind has no hidden manner, no meat that the world knows not of. The human mind is a prodigal. It has only what it knows it has, and each time it uses a little of it, it has that much less. And therefore, the prodigal is the universal human mind. And it is now nearing the time when it is banqueting with swine, when it knows that it cannot rely on money, on treaties, on armies, on bombs. It cannot even rely on its crops. And pretty soon it's going to have nothing left to rely on. And then it will have to turn to the Father's house. And this can never be done one by one, because the next generation would be born and they would have to do it. So it can only be done as the human mind turns to spiritual resources, and then the new generation is born into that higher consciousness. And so only one generation has to become 
destitute. Only one generation has to come to the realization that with all my material things and powers, uh, I am nothing. I am less than a servant of God. Because a servant of God is always safe, always well, always fed, always housed, always clothed. The servant of God lacks nothing. And so the hu whole human mind with its storehouses of wealth and power is less than a servant of God. And that will make it turn. That will bring about the reclothing with the purple robe and the jeweled ring so that individual country will be divine consciousness. Please note that a plane just went overhead and made that roaring noise, but uh, the message was so important, I would like you to hear through the noise rather than to try to do it over again. This will help you to see why it is that a message like the infinite way can bring about the complete spiritualization of consciousness of the world. Not because everybody in the world will become an infinite way student but because every principle of the infinite way that is introduced into your consciousness is not being introduced into your consciousness alone, but into human consciousness. Every principle that has been released in our writings is not merely being released into the writings, into the consciousness of those who read them, they are being introduced into human consciousness. Just the same as when something arouse, comes up in the news of a fearful nature it makes even those people fear who have no knowledge of what's in the news. They just waken in the morning with a sense of fear. And they don't know why. They have absorbed it. And in the same way, there is no reason why the world cannot awaken one morning and realize its freedom. Because if you are communing secretly, silently, sacredly within your own consciousness, are you not communing in the consciousness of everybody in the world who is saying, oh, isn't there a problem, a solution to these problems? Oh, can't God help? What difference does it make whether they're turning to a Chinese God or a Hindu God or a Christian God or Jewish God? Those are only mortal concepts. What they really mean is God. Now, it is in proportion as truth enters consciousness that the entire world is being evangelized. And we see the beginning of this in this way that the introduction of Christian science into human consciousness has not merely benefited Christian scientists. Loads of people have been set free from the fear of death just by no longer talking of death but of passing on. Loads of people have been benefited by the lack of fear in outer effects, germs and so forth. In other words, more people are benefiting in this world from the introduction of Christian science 
than they will ever acknowledge. I would like our teachers to start instructing the students in what you might call treatment without words or thoughts. That is, bring out in them the ability when a claim presents itself to recognize that now there's no human thought that would help the situation, nothing that I could think that would meet the situation, and therefore let me be still and know that I, in the midst of me, is God. Let me hear, let me receive. And then, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, and wait, if necessary, only ten seconds, fifteen seconds, but to train the student to engage in more and more of that type of healing work that sits down and acknowledges that there is no human thought I could think, there is no truth I could know, because only the transcendental presence itself, the Christ itself, dissolves these appearances. And therefore I must sit here and become receptive to the Christ and then listen and it may last 10, 15, 20 seconds the main thing is that the student practice this 10 times a day 20 times a day 30 whatever their own inner uh, impulsion is and there's never any lack of subjects to treat because uh, there is the threat of world war. Uh, there is the threat of economic depression. There is the threat of uh, Asiatic flu. There is uh, the threat of uh, elections. There is uh, enough going on in family life, community life, national life, so that anyone can sit down a dozen times a day and say, how can this situation be met? Well, there's no human thought will meet it. If uh, truth books would do it, there's enough of those published. If just knowing the truth that's in books would do it, there's been enough truth knowing going on. So the next step is the transcendental experience itself. Because this is what the infinite way has been saying in every book. This is not a teaching. This is an experience. And whatever teaching there is, is merely to lead up to the experience. And now we are in that era of the infinite way. When we must approach every problem from the standpoint that now there's no human thought I can think and there's no truth I can know with the mind that is going to solve this. Therefore, I must be about my father's business. I must be listening. I must know that I in the midst of me is God and let it utter itself. Let the voice utter itself that the earth may melt. And therefore, I am developing receptivity. Well, you see, each one of us who is very actively engaged in healing work is working from that standpoint. We have reached the understanding that uh, my human thought is not God's thought. And God's thought is not my human thought. Therefore, my human thought is not power. Even when my human thought is uh, saying a lot of words of truth, it isn't power. There is a mind 
that is called the mind that was in Christ Jesus. That is higher consciousness. There is a higher consciousness. And when it is on the scene, the earth of error melts. Therefore, the meditation or prayer or treatment, which is to be effective, is to be one in which that transcendental mind is actually realized, felt. When I can feel it, when I can know, then it is on the field, it is caring for the situation. And so we must be taking our more serious students into this higher consciousness, not teaching them about it, but bringing them to the actualization of it. In other words, it is as if you were to say, you the teacher, were to say, now look, I really should be able to turn out four or five or six fine teachers, a dozen practitioners. But how? Well, not unless I could uh, lift them to where they could actually realize that the activity of the human mind isn't going to heal, or knowing the truth with the human mind isn't going to heal. Therefore, if I am to be successful as a spiritual teacher, it is in my ability to lift them to that same realization of the tra transcendental presence as I have access to. So that just as I am saying, I have meat, I have hidden manna, my function is to bring my student to where they can say the same. Then they can go out into the world and do likewise just as Jesus, in sending out the disciples, must have uh, raised them to some measure of his consciousness, certainly not enough, but to some measure of it, or they couldn't have gone out. Now, you cannot do this teaching people truth. You can only do it when uh, they are willing to be taken up higher, lifted higher, by these specific practices and uh, finally made to realize when we speak of the Christ we're not speaking about a term in the Bible we are speaking about an actual presence that is here and which is as tangible to us as your money in the bank is tangible to you and until the Christ becomes that tangible to you as an experience, you do not have hidden manna. You do not have meat the world knows not of. You only have quotations about it. Now you must come to the experience. And that is the part that we are functioning in. Because the more of us there are with the experience, the more will be drawn to us. You know, when I went into 236 Huntington Avenue as a Christian Science practitioner, I was the only practitioner in the building. And for about three years I remained the only one. And others just would not come in because the feeling was that there wasn't enough pra practice for uh, more than one. In fact, before I went in, they didn't even think there was enough practice for one. Hmm? But I did prove that there was, and they thought, well, then I must have all the practice. But gradually, after the third year, a second one, and a third, and a fourth, and when I left the building, there were over 60 practitioners in the building. Now, they may not all have been busy, successful ones, because a lot of people go in the practice that are not equipped for it. But those who were, were successful 
in that building because spirit multiplies. It doesn't divide. If I have a healing consciousness, it will draw unto me my own. But if I find somebody in Honolulu to share that practice with, it doesn't lessen my practice, it multiplies my practice. And then if that one finds somebody in Honolulu, it doesn't lessen their practice, it multiplies. Because what happens is, some of hers come to me, and some of mine goes to her, and some of his will come to both of us. And it'll keep on and keep on multiplying. Do you see? So the more spiritually illumined students we can turn out, the greater will be the activity of students seeking and patients seeking. Thank you.